Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to start in any minute. We're just giving a minute so that people can join the session. Perfect. Welcome, welcome to today's session. I'm making sure that I have my chat open and wonderful. Awesome. So we'll get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really thrilled that you're with us. Uh, this is the first webinar that we do in a new exciting format that is action uh, packed. We're going to have a few um, worksheets that you can use after this session so that you can go through the next steps of how to achieve curriculum alignment. So with that, let me get started here. Wonderful. Before we get started, I want to introduce Dr. Stephanie Putty. Director, uh, Executive Director, Center of for Teaching and Learning from Franklin Pierce University. Dr. Cuddy, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, um, while we were preparing for this session, we were talking about how sometimes faculty conf get confused between what are competencies, what are objectives, and what are outcomes. Do you want to share a little bit about that conversation that we were having right before this webinar? Sure. Um, I think some of the, the struggle is that those words uh, can sometimes be used interchangeably. Uh, and, and so there's this, um, you know, competencies are bigger picture items. Competencies are related to how a program, what, what students will be able to do upon exit of a program. Um, outcomes are more course driven. Um, and of course, you can have competencies at the course level, but really you need to kind of make sure that all of those things align. And when those terms are used somewhat interchangeably, it can be confusing to really uh, create those competencies effectively, create those outcomes effectively, create those objectives effectively. That's a great explanation how we might cause the confusion by using the terms inter interchangeably. Um, and I wanted to start with that because this presentation is all focused on competency because it's at the highest level what we need for accreditation. But what we depend on is the course learning objectives, the, 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 we need the, the objectives and we need the outcomes as well. So as we go through the presentation, I just wanna share with everyone that we're talking about competencies, but keep in mind that faculty need to know the difference between these three. Um, with that being said, um, just super quick, if I can get your support for technical check, if you won't, can participate in this, um, make sure that you can chat with us. Please let us know from what school you're, um, what school you're representing what discipline, I just wanna make sure that everyone has access to the chat so that you can ask questions. Let's see. Uh-oh, let's see, nobody has texted anything. Wonder if the chat is available. There we go, they all came at the same time. UT Help Houston, awesome. We have Tavata from UN, UNM, College of Pharmacy. We have Lincoln Memorial. Ah, oh, the USF, awesome, Debbie, nice to see you. Awesome, Texas A&M, Loma Linda, University School of Pharmacy, great. See, Kansas City University, College of Osteopathic Medicine, awesome, so it worked, great, just making sure it works. So as we're talking about curriculum alignment, alignment ensures that we're teaching and assessing the desired knowledge and skills and abilities students need to acquire. It needs to be consistent guaranteeing that all curriculum elements are working towards the same goal. We need to avoid gaps. We need to avoid redundancy. It has to be progress progressive. And what do I mean by that? It has to be structured in such a way that the students are, are being taught and assessed at the lowest level of Bloom taxonomy and gradually advancing to the highest level. It needs to support accreditation efforts by demonstrating alignment with external standards and competencies has to be collaborative, shift the focus mindset, the faculty mindset from my course to embracing my program. So from what you're hearing, like what, are, what do you find hard about curriculum alignment? At your program, please feel free to text. I would love to see uh, from your point of view, what's the hardest part about curriculum alignment? Let's see, we'll give you a second. What do you find the hardest, uh, Dr. Cuddy? 
Um, I think it's ensuring that everybody's on the same page. Um, and then it is the just getting everybody to consistently do their part. You know, uh, we have, you can have their, your competencies, but if the faculty aren't necessarily aligning their courses to the competencies or giving back the data that's necessary to ensure curriculum alignment, it can be really complicated. Yes, and we're hearing from, from our attendees, the compressing and finding those redundancies. Mm -hmm. Mapping with exams and everyone on the same page, as you mentioned, same page. Consistent curriculum revision to ensure that they're on the same page. Getting faculty to see the big picture uh, of the curriculum. Reverse the course. Buy-in. Faculty buy-in is extremely important. And having a holistic approach. Love it. Determine and have to map just one Netflix competency. Meaning determine how to map to the board exams, right? Um, I think... You're not alone. Uh, I've been there as a former director of assessment. It was an overwhelming task. I mean, picture this. You're tasked with completing a giant puzzle, but there's no picture to guide you. You just have the pieces, a box full of pieces. That's where you can feel really overwhelming, not only for the assessment person, but also for faculty. And especially during crisis mode, self-study accreditation. The process of categorizing your assessment, ensuring proper alignment, meeting high deadlines can quickly feel monumental without clear direction, leaving you overwhelmed and uncertain about where to begin. So that's one of the challenges. The second one is that you might have lack of data evidence, but this is not to get confused with lack of data. You might have a lot of data, but not insights. The faculty and assessment people are often face the challenge of demonstrating the clear alignment between assessment and competences. And this happens because of lack of sufficient insights to support this alignment or struggle to interpret the data in meaningful ways or find it difficult to provide evidence on how uh, for accreditation or program improvement. Without reliable data evidence, aligning assessments with competencies becomes unclear making it really hard to drive inform decisions and demonstrate success. The third challenge that we see that uh, our attendees were sharing with us as well is lack of faculty engagement. When faculty disengage from the process of aligning competencies with the curriculum, the program effectiveness and, I mean, student success are compromised. This results in difficulty meeting accreditation and assessment goals, fragmented efforts in curriculum alignment, missed opportunities to improve student outcome. Without that active faculty involvement, the alignment process stalls, making it harder to create comprehensive improvement plans. Um, I've been there on all those three, right? And also, let's think about how faculty are extremely smart. They have PhDs. They don't just want to know, like, they just don't want the assessment or the dean to tell them what to do. They want to know why, and they want to see the big picture. So today's presentation, I promise to guide you through these, through the steps needed to overcome the challenges and achieve alignment. But out of the three problems, which one do you relate most with? Please feel free to text um, Dr. Cuddy. Not to put you in the stuff, but which one do you think is the one that you relate the most with? Overwhelming tasks, lack of data evidence, or faculty engagement? Um, I think it is probably, uh, it starts with the overwhelming task. And then our second highest issue is that um, lack of data evidence. Uh, the data is all there, like you said, it's just now I have all these numbers, so what do they really what? mean? Uh, and so that's definitely, those Those two are probably very equal. Um, faculty engagement, it's not always easy, uh, but like you said, they once you, you, once you can really kind of give them the why, I mean, they're true adult learners at this stage in their lives, so they need to know why they have to do this thing, um, and they will, you know, typically come along uh, and, and participate. And I think they wanna participate. I think they wanna know that the programs are strong, um, but it's that overwhelming task of all of this data that 
probably means something, but I'm not quite sure if it means something. So. Absolutely. And that's my promise today is that I'm going to go through the steps on overcoming these challenges and we'll focus on three key outcomes. Uh, the first one, I want to focus on how do we go from that overwhelming uh, feeling to feeling um, to feel clarity, direction and control. Like by setting up the right category structure and exam stuff and disclaimer, I might mention exams of an M plus, but they're just tools that allow you to streamline some of the processes, but everything that we'll discuss can be done with or without those tools. Everyone has to do curriculum alignment. So how to set it up correctly in exam stuff. What must be assessed versus nice to assess? Because when every single competency or objective or outcome is extremely important, then nothing is. Then foster a clear communication with faculty. Like I, like I mentioned, they're extremely smart. They just don't want to be told what they have to do, but they want to know why and how they contribute to that big picture. And the third but not the last is how do you use tools to streamline the alignment process? Now, from there, we're going to go and talk about how to go from feeling that lack of data evidence to obtaining actionable insights. Go beyond just collecting data, but unlocking those insights, how to integrate your curriculum now with assessment data. Because if that's not integrated, just imagine this, you're using Wix. You have to go to Chicago from Texas. I'm in San Antonio. From San Antonio to Chicago, I'm using Wix. Where you are, you, when you're using the app, you have a map in the background that is showing your current location and the path you have ahead of you. Imagine if Wix didn't show you the map. Imagine if it just show you a line and the coordinates or something like that, I would be lost. So we need to integrate those two things, the assessment data with the curriculum map, because I'll, doing that, we can truly answer the questions of where are the gaps, where are the redundancies, and in what data, in what areas the students struggling. So curriculum alignment, first one that we're gonna go through how to feel clarity, direction, control by organizing the competencies framework, by communicating with faculty and simplifying the al alignment process, tagging. So for that, I wanna share this um, worksheet and we're gonna be sharing these worksheets um, after the, the webinar. Um, but think about, how, for this worksheet, I wanna start talking about uh, if you think about it, the difference between desire and require competencies. We desire, I want to assess everything, right? We all want to. There's so many different competencies out there. I know I'm adding Blooms and Blooms is not a competency, but we know that we always want to tag the cognitive level of the, uh, of the level that we're assessing those competencies. From there, I'm just going to use, uh, for instance, uh, program outcomes, right? And then we probably have the board exam in pharmacy, the NAPLEX, right? And then from there, I'm going to misspell the, the COPA. There's a new set of uh, uh, competencies. I think I'm misspelling that. COPA. And then from there, maybe Appendix B or Appendix, I'll call it 1 or B, <laughs> A. So we have these competencies, right? Why do I have five in here? Because once again, we wanna keep it concise. If you have a list that is longer than this, please add them. Because the next question you should be asking yourself is, are we cross walking these competencies? One set to another one. For instance, program outcomes, yes, we are. And it's to COPA, right? And maybe NAPLEX, we're not, and that's fine, but I'll just go through an exercise. So that, that means that I don't need to have COPA in exams of category. Because if we ask faculty to tag with five to eight, seven, 10 competencies or categories, they're not gonna be tagging, it's time consuming. So you can use the data to transform the um, assessment data to the COPA since you have the crosswalk. So this is nice to have and not must have. Is an exam tough? No, we don't need it. 
right? So that's how we go through the exercise. That's step one. Step two is the required competencies. Once, once you went through this, we just put them down here and I'll put the first one, blooms. And then we need to ask ourselves, is faculty familiarized with blooms? Do they know the understanding between remember, the difference between remember and understand, the difference between understand and apply? If they don't, then what resource or session are we gonna have so that they feel more comfortable and familiarize with these resources. Because at the end, we're gonna rely on their tagging, we're gonna rely on their alignment of the assessment with the competency, so that they can be part of the big picture. And what do we mean by big picture? Why does curriculum alignment matter? How does the curriculum alignment contribute to student mastery of competency? So that they're ready to practice. And how do we ensure um, that curriculum alignment, that they're part of the big picture that we share with them that it's not just about their course, but it's about the program. And last but not least, technical session. If you're using ExamSoft, show them how it's being done in ExamSoft, how they can find the category. And it's being done in, um, in like Canvas competency. Show them how uh, it can be done there. Um, Dr. Cotty, any input or insights, anything you would like to share about require, desire versus require competency? Um, I, I think that there's a whole lot of confusion around desired and required because desired is everything, right? We want to, we want to measure everything. Um, but as these kinds of programs, there are very specific competencies that are expected and those generally are driven. Oh. Uh, by the national board exams that all of these graduates have to pass to be successful and enter the into the uh, practice field. And so, uh, you know, like we would love to have all the things, but that's not really possible. So we do have to really kind of trim it down to the required competencies. And as you mentioned, a lot of times those are, you know, those are associated with COPA or NAPLEX or uh, ARCPA standards. Um, those kind of things are really the, the really required competencies. We have to ensure that those are being met. Um, and then, like you said, we have to just make sure that faculty know how to connect the dots. So they can, they start to see all of the dots, but then we have to draw the lines between the dots. We have to show them how to connect their dot to the bigger dot. So that's the that's the other big overwhelming task because I often and when I train faculty I say I understand your cognitive energy to learn something new is probably depleted, given all the things you do in a day the teaching the advising, the student project leadership all of those things your cognitive energy to learn something new is always a little little depleted uh, on any given day and so it is hard to to do that technical session piece as well so. All of them are hard because it's a lot of information and the competencies keep changing. It's not that there's a vast number of competencies, but they keep changing. So I would love to hear from our attendees. Well, here, I would love to read from our attendees if they can type, what's the hardest part about obtaining that clarity, direction, control? Um, what, what do you have? Um, let us know if it's more about finding out the desired competency, I mean, the required competency faculty buy-in, uh, understanding of the competencies. I'll just wait a second and see if we have any engagement. This is a new approach, as I said, we wanna make it um, engaging and we'll see if someone types in. Don't be shy, we have all been <laughs> with those challenges. Um, but as we're waiting for that, uh, I wanna share some of the, the third component of streamlining or obtaining clarity and direction is to leverage as many tools as you can. Um, and especially if you have, I know budgets are constrained, uh, but if you have the budgets or if you can help faculty, how do you leverage some of the tools? Some schools have exam soft. And what I wanna to share today is our new tool called Competency GD. And I'll move my screens. Um, that can help faculty not only tag their items, so make it easier for them, but also get familiarized with the competencies or with Bloom's taxonomy. When you click on a question, uh, Competency Genie pops on the side. 
and it tells you what Bloom's taxonomy you're assessing and what the PAN uh, competencies are. This is for PA programs, but we have a lot of, I'll show you the list of all the competencies that we have. But how do they get familiarized with that? Well, they get to see the question and it tells them why AI thinks that this question is at the applied level. It tells them why it thinks that it's cardiovascular system. And it also tells them why it's a pan task category formulating the most likely diagnosis. So you're not only facilitating the tagging process, but you're also um, giving some guidance to faculty so they get more familiarized with all of these competencies. And if you want to add more competencies, you can just simply go to the list. And like I said, we have a lot uh, going on. Um, let me see. Can you all see my screen? Are you seeing the tool? Uh, sorry. That's the thing about, can you all see my screen now? Perfect. Sorry, I apologize for that. So when you go to a question, you click, it labels your question. And as I mentioned, the, it not only tells you what the competencies are for that question that you're assessing, but it actually shows you why AI thinks it's blooms, why it thinks are these competencies. So you're guiding faculty, right? And remember, AI will never be 100% accurate. It's just a guiding tool. It's an assistant. Uh, it's easier to disagree with AI than to start from scratch and try to recall the list of 30 competencies. What am I assessing, right? So that's how it works. So these are some of the things that you can do to leverage uh, today's technology to facilitate the process. Now going back, <clears throat> I'm always afraid of trying new technology and I knew it. <laughs> um, but in here, now you have two options with Competency Genie. You can either use the Chrome extension. If you're interested, just let us know. We'll send you the interest, the, the details. Just say, I'm in, or send me the details and we'll send you the details. Uh, the second option is that we can pull your data directly from ExamSub and tag that data for you. And then we would give you a clean, concise report that shows you your curriculum and integrate it with your curriculum map. It works with exams of enterprise and it also works with legacy. It works with both. Uh, so we're all good. Um, so today I wanna to share a story with all of you. Um, I met Dr. Cuddy, uh, Dr. Cuddy was it maybe two months ago? Time went by so fast. No, three? That's flown. Uh, I think it was probably it was like in April, May. Early May. Yeah. Yeah, we met because, as you all know, we sent emails out. We're talking about competency genie and we're talking about different things. Uh, Dr. Cotty was going through the self-study uh, process for the PA program. Uh, and the report was due in a month. And you needed something to help you with curriculum alignment, the curriculum report, because that's one of the big things that the self-study is requiring. So you book a call with us, we met, and I think within a couple of weeks, you became a customer of us and and we took the task and tagged all your items. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you share a little bit more about your story of where you were, where yeah. we help you be now, and your vision is to, to drive, to drive long-term success in your program? Yeah, so um, we, uh, our program is a relatively young program. And um, in just a matter of a few months, we had a almost 100% turnover in our program. Uh, and our new interim director, um, almost by chance, found out that there was an interim self-study uh, that was due for accreditation visit that happens about a month from now, um, a month from when she uncovered that it was due. Um, and so uh, that pretty much sent everybody into panic mode. Um, and, and as Ali said, we met and I looked at this, uh, they did a demo and I was blown away. I was like, I've been in higher ed for 15 plus years. And this is the tool that I have been wishing and hoping for. Um, and so within just probably a matter of maybe 10 days, we went from, um, initial demo to, uh, purchase agreement to complete and utter installation into Canvas and ExamSoft and having the dashboards available to us to start really um, analyzing the data 
analyzing all of the pieces that needed to come together to give us a clear picture of how the curriculum was doing so that we could prepare that for the self-study report and, and know with confidence that what we were putting in the self-study report was accurate. So yeah, it's uh, it's been a lifesaver. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to hear. And, and we're just starting. Uh, you were, you're actually, you were our first user of the categorizer, which is that mm -hmm. we pull the data and label it with all the PAN competencies, which is the blueprint for the board exam for physician assistant programs. Um, and there's a lot more possibilities. There's a lot of more programs that are moving to competency-based education, but they're not providing feedback to the students. So going back to the analogy of the map, Imagine telling the students, this is your road trip and good luck. There's no even a bottle of water or a map. <laughs> You'll have to do it on your own. Let's there see, no, figure it out. There are no snacks along the way. So. <laughs> There's no snacks or no indication that you're going the right way or not. And you might be going in circles. And that's why we have students repeating the same courses over and over again. And then some students will leave the program and they leave yeah. the program which affects the program because they don't receive the tuition, but it drastically affects the student because they don't even have a degree to get a job and start paying for the student loans, yeah. which are getting crazy amounts, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the big picture, like as, as we covered, um, how do we go from an overwhelming task to clarity, direction, control? You have to go through this exercise and it doesn't have to be exactly the way we put it on the worksheet, but you have to ask yourself, are we assessing the right things? Are we setting ourselves for success with accreditation? How to share the story with faculty so they feel part of the big picture and how to provide tools so that we can simplify the job, so that we can simplify the task. Now, um, the next um, challenge is the lack of data evidence and how, to, how what do we need to do so that we can obtain actionable insights? Um, from there, this is what I call the, and I'm changing my screen here, there we go. Um, in here, this is what I call the three columns. There are the three outcomes that we want. We want to gain confidence in our data. We want to unlock actionable insights and reveal meaningful insights. And in order to do this, we need tools to collect the data. In this case, a lot of programs are using exam stuff and competency genie combination of influx. The second one, as I said, integrate your curriculum map and your assessment data. Actually, I would love to hear from here, <laughs> read from, but yes, hear from our attendees. How many of you have late integrated your curriculum map with your assessment data? Because I feel like a lot of schools and programs talk about gaps in the curriculum, but gaps in the curriculum, they're talking about the intention. The intention is to have zero gaps. But do you have gaps after you plan the attention? Like once you have the assessment data, are you finding gaps in there? Um, and I find that not a lot of programs are doing that. Um, so Dr. DeBreeze, in, pro in progress, uh, in process, in process. Anyone else, um, if you need one, just say need one, <laughs> need, need to integrate the data. If you integrate this data, then you can ask the question that I was saying. Do we have gaps? What, the intention was there and we were counting in one professor, one course to assess this competency and it didn't happen. And we found out because the students felt that competency on the board exam. Do we need to wait that long? Do we have any redundancy? Are some faculty members reassessing everything that the previous course did? And the way I can share that story is about like AMP, anatomy and physiology. If you have AMP1 and AMP2, imagine if the professor from AMP2, without looking at how they perform in the first one, reassesses everything again to know where the students are. They should count on, on the curriculum data um, to see that. The other thing is being able to see if the students are transitioning well in the program, meaning they're mastering their competencies and knowledge of that is to the point that they're ready to practice or they're ready for clinical rotations? Are they going from 70s to 80s to 90s? Are you seeing that progression? Is the Bloom taxonomy aligned with that? And if they're not, what can we do? That's the key on finding actionable insight. 
gaining trust in your data, unlocking those insights and revealing that information by asking these questions. Uh, Katie Sim Simpson, definitely need one. A lot of programs need one. I was there as a, a program director. Um, now, faculty buy-in, right? The next question is, how do we help, like, once you have the answers to these questions, especially it happens in the curriculum committee, how do we share that with faculty? You need to share those insights because they need to be part of the action plans for continuous quality improvement. And a big one, document it. Because if you don't document it, it didn't happen. Then you don't have exhibits for the self-study and then you're treasure hunting the last minute. So how do you document it and show them the alignment with accreditation, with your strategic plan, with your assessment plan? So Dr. Cuddy, what are some of the, like, challenges that you see sometimes when you're sharing insights with faculty? Um, honestly, it's a lot of, it's sometimes it's a lack of data. Um, you know, there was a lot of supposition that um, a couple of courses were really teaching the same thing. Uh, and there was some overlap. There wasn't this kind of clear, consistent continuity thread, if you will, throughout the curriculum. And so there's a lot of supposition. So Influx data honestly helped paint the picture that says, yep, you guys are all assessing the exact same thing. And so on some levels, that's okay. Uh, but in some cases, it's not okay because if they're, they're using the same questions to ask the same thing that accomplishes the same competency, then maybe we're missing something. Uh, and as you mentioned, getting all the way, getting pants results and finding out that they weren't they weren't prepared is is catastrophic. So um, so for faculty collaboration, it really is just showing them the data, telling them what that data means, you know, that says, hey, you're in A&P and you're in pathophysiology and you're teaching the exact same thing. Like A&P, I need you to focus your energies here. Pathophys, I need you to focus your energies here so that you're not teaching the exact same thing. Uh, and that can happen, especially when you have brand new faculty. Um, it can happen when you have adjunct faculty uh, who are teaching courses. Um, it can happen in a variety of contexts for a variety of reasons. Um, but when you can really show them that you, you can prove you can prove documented evidence that says, hey guys, and when you can go back to your creditors and say, we uncovered this kind of thing. And as a result, uh, in reflective practice, we have we have taken this curriculum and modified it slightly to accommodate this. And so far the results are promising. Uh, and so it's really is that, that kind of reflective practice that's necessary that taking the whole picture and looking at it and saying, hmm, maybe we're, Maybe we've missed the mark in one class and we've overmarked in another. And so we need to kind of realign and ensure that what we're promising we're teaching is actually what we're assessing. So, um, but I think that the fact, I think faculty really do want to be part of it because they understand, especially in these kind of programs, that without those accreditations, there's no more program. And so I don't think they want to shirk their responsibility, but I think that they're looking at the wall of post-it notes and not knowing where to begin. And so yeah. um, I think that they want to be involved um, either via curriculum committees or as a faculty, as a whole body, um, but they just don't know where to begin. And again, that cognitive energy factor, and then the, there's only so many hours in a day factor. And so, you know, competency genie takes the guesswork out of it. Cause I often say, I'd rather edit something than start from scratch. So um, yeah, it, it provided, provides you with, the insights that are necessary to help faculty kind of see where their course fits in the whole picture and where everything they're assessing aligns with overall program competencies. So I do think yeah. they want to get involved. They just don't know where to start because it is such an overwhelming task. It's a warm, overwhelming task. And sometimes the reflections stay within the curriculum com committee and doesn't go out to the masses especially the new faculty, so that they get to see the big picture and their contribution to the big picture. So the way I think about it, simplifying it, because I'm not a pharmacist, or I'm, not, I'm not a doctor, I'm an engineer, or um, a lot of different things. Um, it's like, imagine if I'm teaching calculus 
and I need to teach about differential equations and I'm getting worried about my students not knowing how to multiply or add. Like that's not my job in that, in that course. But I do wanna know what their skills are. So if I am able to see the curriculum uh, map over assessment data on it, then I can see, do they come with strong math skills or not? Do we need to revisit a few topics? And that's where the saying of shift their focus from my course to our program. How are we helping each other take the students through the program successfully? Um, I thank you for, for sharing that. As an engineer, <laughs> uh, I don't know if um, this is well known in the academic world. Uh, my background is industrial engineering, so it's all about continuous quality improvement. So I was shocked when I was doing assessment and we were calling it continuous quality improvement, but we were doing it every five years. But like, that's not continuous. We need to continue, truly continuously do it. And one of the methodologies that I like to use is the five why. So if we found a problem, let's ask five times why, because it would help us find the root cause instead of just the symptom. So for instance, and I'll go through another example, and we'll provide the worksheets, as I said, but this is for you to go, we provide a general example. Imagine that you, the problem statement, you wanna start there. We identify areas where the students are not performing well in our assessment, or maybe the board exam. Outcome A and B, or competency A and B, and they're not performing well. Why are the students not performing well in A and B? Well, they're struggling with understanding key concepts related to these competencies. Or imagine, we don't have data to us to confirm that they were actually taught and assessed those competencies, right? After that, you, you wanna ask yourself the second why, but why? Well, maybe the instructional materials are not aligned with the competency, or maybe the professor didn't align their syllabus or the courses with the curriculum app. They forgot to change things in their, pro, in their course. Their why, why are the instructional materials not aligned? Well, faculty members were not fully aware of the required competencies when creating the course content. The first time I ever created a curriculum map integrated with assessment data, I had faculty that had an aha moment. Like, oh, I was not aware that, yeah, I know my competencies or the course learning outcomes or the, uh, or, or the objectives, but I was not aware at what level of blooms I was supposed to be at with the students. So that aha moment, right? And then four, keep asking like, but why? Until you get to that problem statement. So I'll go just quickly for time. You go to the root cause. From this analysis, the root cause is that there is no formal process for regularly updating and training faculty on competencies. This leads to misalignment. And imagine that you might find out, well, we never had a session with faculty where we show them the big picture. This is a curriculum map. This is how the students are doing. And this is how your course is part of the big, big picture. But finding the root cause is not the finish line. They're just milestones. Uh, we need next step. We need an action plan. An action plan where you're describing exactly what you're gonna do, who's a responsible party, and by party, I mean a person. Don't do a committee, because <laughs> then the bystander effect is gonna happen. Everyone thinks that someone did it, but nobody did it. So everyone thinks everyone called 911 and nobody called 911. So we need to be careful with that. Hold someone accountable. I call it a champion. Dr. Cotty is the champion for this action plan and it's due December 11 at the end of the academic term. And measure of success has to be, that's why I put measure of success has to be measurable. Don't say just student excellence or student preparedness or no, students need to obtain X in this outcome or competency by December 11. Document it and align it with your accreditation standards, your strategic plan and your assessment plan and show this to faculty. This is part of the big picture and the big one. I, this is a never ending challenge, closing the assessment loop. We always like plan, 
we do and then we forget to analyze. I find that one and one and like all over again. Why? Because we didn't set up a reminder. We put it in the minutes and that's great, but we probably forgot about it. And we see the same problem all over again and say, didn't Dr. Bob said that he was going to do this? They're like, oh yeah, but Dr. Bob retired three months ago. What are we going to do now? So institutional knowledge is gone. The reminder is gone and you're facing the same challenge all over again and just wasting everyone's time and effort. So a key, of, of course, those that have influx have the action plans and you can schedule everything ahead of time and alignment. But if you don't, here's a trick that I have on my own. I schedule emails to myself to go out. So I can schedule an email and say on December, like go out on December 10th. And in the email, it says, hey, Ale, don't forget to do this, this and that because it's due on December 11th to myself, because my inbox is my to-do list. So for those that don't have influx or don't have a system, just remember that you can schedule emails to yourself so that you can remind everyone about, I, actually, you can even schedule the emails to the curriculum committee so that everyone is on the same page. Key takeaways, we wanna hear from you. What what did you learn, notice? What would you like to share with your team? Let's see. Like I said, don't be shy. We have all been in the same place. That's why I created Enflux because it was so overwhelming to do all of this manually on spreadsheet. What we want is more collaboration, no more spreadsheet. We want people to contribute to the action plans that are gonna help us to continuously improve our program and ensure alignment of the competencies with the curriculum. I think people are shy today after cutting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's huge. It I, I can't I cannot state that enough. That alignment with curriculum is really huge. Um, one of the biggest things that um, from the student side of things that I can appreciate is that I can look at the data in almost real time. Like I can go into Influx and I can see. Um, how the students performed on their anatomy one exam one you know and and the faculty has the same view they can go in and they can look and see how everybody performed and if there was something that was really missing uh, and so they can kind of revise their curriculum on the fly to make sure they kind of reteach a concept or something of that nature rather than just saying okay well that test is over let's move on um, because these programs are all so cumulative. Every course leads into the next, every year leads into the next. And so you can't just leave somebody behind. Uh, and, and so that's a huge asset to the, that the competency genie tags everything and that at a glance, at any time, I can enter into Influx and I can see how the program as a whole is doing. I can see how a course is doing, I can see how a student is doing. And that to me, that's the living in the land of spreadsheets is never ideal because as you mentioned, like sometimes people leave, sometimes people retire, sometimes people find a better job. Um, and so when they go, whatever they knew or whatever they were doing goes with them. And like you said, people are starting all over from the beginning. And that's honestly where we found ourselves is that all any data that had been collected went with someone. There was no yeah. more access to those files. And so there was no, it was starting over from scratch for a program that was a year old. Uh, and so that was painful. And it, it, was, a, it was a large lesson learned. Um, and that's why Influx has um, really saved us in that vein because now that data doesn't just live with me or you, it lives with the entire program and everybody from the dean, the didactic director, clinical director, everybody has access and can see what's going on at a moment's notice and can generate the necessary reports to be, to, to provide the evidence uh, when those accreditation reports come due. So it is a, it is a great thing. Um, like I said, it was the thing that really, I was like, where has this been all my life? Because <laughs> yeah searching for the data, having to go in and manually extract things out of a learning management system or 
um, asking faculty to give the data up, like to just send the scores or what have you, is just sometimes really painful. And then it's the chasing down those people to get that information. And so it was just a lot of, there's always a lot of moving parts in, in assessment, um, but to have all those parts kind of come together in a very clean, very nicely amalgamated way is just phenomenal, so. It's awesome to hear that, you know, when I created Enflux, I knew there were a lot of moving parts and that I wanted people to be more on the actual planning than on the spreadsheets and finding insights or treasure hunting, which I love to call it. I wanted them to have the self-study as a true reflection of what they have done. What are some of the challenges and what are the action plans? I didn't want them to spend time on data. I never thought about turnover and how that was gonna affect the schools. I wish I could say that, but no, I never did. But we're hearing it more and more. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, like so-and-so left, but I'm actually, someone, a program director gave me a call and say, so-and-so is gonna leave. Am I, what's in jeopardy? I was like, nothing, everything is in the platform. Um, and the other thing that I'm hearing is someone left the program and had reports or had advanced spreadsheets and they don't know how to maintain the spreadsheets or the advanced reporting. So it depends on a person, right? If they got to the skills to create something really well done, they're going to go and find a job somewhere else. Um, and, and that's what happens, right? So what's next? Like I said, this is our new format of webinars. We are even thinking about changing it to worksheets. I mean, um, now work, um, more working sessions, but as we went through all of this, um, next steps is to identify within your program, what are the things that you need to work on the most? I think that's a key way. And I put a, the red, green, and yellow, because if you print this out after the session, it would be great if you highlight those areas where you need to work next. Take advantage of the worksheets that we share. If you see any room of improvement on the worksheets, let me know, happy to help you out. Next one, let us know if you want to try Competency Genie for 60 days, totally free. We have a lot of different competencies, especially right now for pharmacy, nursing, PA, vet schools, uh, PT programs. Let us know. Just say in or send me an email. We'll send you the recording of the webinar and we'll meet with you to share the details. Second, this is a big announcement. We're starting in November a cohort of Assessment Academy. So Influx, Influx Assessment Academy, Dr. Cotty, what we just went through, we're gonna go through that with you because we're finding out that we're giving so much insight that that can also be overwhelming. So how can we meet with you and go, where are you? Where do you wanna be? These are the next steps that we need to take. And we do it in a collaborative way with weekly one hour sessions for maybe six weeks, nine weeks. And it's one hour a week where we go through these steps. We clean your data, confirm everything as well. And we go through the exercise of how to improve curriculum alignment. If you want to be part of this, Tabata, I saw you. Um, just tell us. We'll send you more information. We're doing this with our customers. So there's still time to uh, um, register if you're not a customer. And we really, really appreciate everyone's help. And, and support. And thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Cuddy, thank you so much for your insights and for sharing your story. We really appreciate it. My pleasure.